these exonerees spent 25 years or longer unjustly imprisoned, 11 served more than 30 years. These figures underestimate the actual amount of time lost. They do not include the often substantial time, sometimes several years, these exonerees spent in jail awaiting trial. 19 exonerations in 2020 were based in whole or in part on post-conviction DNA testing, about 15% of the total. Overall, DNA exonerations now account for about 19% of the exonerations in the registry. 74% of the DNA exonerations were homicide cases, four were for sexual assault, and one was for attempted robbery. 87 exonerations involved misconduct by government officials. Government misconduct encompasses a wide range of behavior, from police officers threatening witnesses, to forensic analysts falsifying test results, to prosecutors hiding evidence of innocence. The most frequent form of misconduct involved the failure to disclose evidence. In 79 exonerations, police or prosecutors withheld exculpatory evidence from the defense. There was evidence of prosecutorial misconduct in 51 exonerations and police misconduct in 74. 13 cases involved false confessions, including 4 by juveniles. 9 exonerees falsely confessed to murder, 2 to supporting terrorism, 1 to child sex abuse, and 1 to assault. Officials engaged in misconduct in the interrogations of these exonerees in 6 cases. 51 exonerations in 2020 were cases in which no crime even occurred. The largest group of no-crime exonerations involved drug crimes, but six child sex abuse exonerations and seven homicide exonerations were also no-crime cases, five murder, and two manslaughter. The remaining 14 included exonerations of crimes such as assault, bribery, burglary, child abuse, conspiracy, sex offender registration violations, solicitation, supporting terrorism, tampering with a government record, and weapons offenses. 103 exonerations included witnesses who committed perjury or otherwise falsely accused the defendant, including 56 murders, 9 cases of child sex abuse, and 3 sexual assaults. In 35 of these cases, an official actor, typically a police officer, lied under oath. There were also 22 drug crimes involving perjury and false accusation. 17 of the drug crimes were cases involving misconduct tied to Ronald Watts, a former sergeant in the Chicago Police Department. In 35 of these cases, involving perjury and false accusation, the exonerees were charged with crimes that never occurred. 30 cases included mistaken witness identification, 13 of which involved cross-racial identification, a significant risk factor for misidentification. 23 of the 30 involved murder or attempted murder. 3. Involved robbery, 2 involved sexual assault, 1 involved assault, and 1 involved an attempted assault. 38 cases involved false or misleading forensic evidence. 23 were for murder or manslaughter. 3 involved child sexual abuse and 2 involved sexual assault of an adult. 3 involved a drug conviction, 2 involved robberies, 2 were for child abuse, and 2 for supporting terrorism. The remaining cases involved assault, attempted murder, and conspiracy. It is virtually impossible in the abstract to grasp the magnitude of the injustice and suffering these numbers represent. People, some as young as 11 years old, saw their lives brutally interrupted. Others were plucked from classrooms. They lost careers and opportunities. They were unable to properly mourn the death of parents and loved ones. Many saw their children grow up and start families of their own. For these grandchildren, their only knowledge of a grandparent was someone locked in a prison. The human faces reflect stories of marriages and relationships that fell apart or never happened. Love was lost or extinguished as family and friends mistakenly concluded, perhaps, that their loved ones really were guilty. Only these wrongfully convicted people can truly understand the loneliness, pain, indignity, danger, and hopelessness of life in prison. The Registry continues to tell these stories to shed light on the wrongfully convicted and to honor them for keeping hope alive. 
Freedom, even delayed freedom, is a precious gift to long-suffering exonerees. For some, there is the added benefit of compensation, though the amount and level of difficulty to obtain it varies from state to state. Some states offer nothing. Others, such as Texas, offer significant compensation benefits. In early 2021, Idaho became the 36th state to enact legislation providing compensation to the wrongfully convicted, in addition to a statute for federal cases and the District of Columbia. Professor Jeffrey Gutman of George Washington University Law School reported that of the 2,588 exonerees wrongly convicted in state courts as of the end of 2020, 44 percent had received some form of compensation, either pursuant to state statute or by a federal civil rights or torts claim. Not surprisingly, these men and women comprise nearly 57 percent of the years lost. The total compensation for these men and women is nearly $2.8 billion. Even with compensation, years lost can't be regained. The physical toll of incarceration doesn't disappear when a person is exonerated. In some particularly tragic cases, freedom was painfully short-lived. John Brown was convicted of murder in Arkansas in 1992. He was released from prison on September 19, 2018, and although he was free, he was not exonerated until September 10, 2020. The stain of a wrongful conviction had been removed for only 109 days when, on December 28, 2020, Brown died, suffering from congestive heart failure resulting from years of untreated high blood pressure during his 26 years in prison. Olin, Pete, Coons, who spent more than 10 years in prison for a murder in Kansas he did not commit, died on February 21, 2021, just 108 days after his release. His body, his attorneys said, was broken, the result of continued state neglect and mistreatment.